Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to another program of Love for the Truth. You are not going to want to miss this show. The truth is various occults have entered the organized church. And have you noticed that spiritual, quote, experience has become the quest of many liberal churches these days rather than biblical discipleship? You know, many of us have witnessed either on TV or firsthand professing Christians exhibiting bizarre behaviors like rolling on the ground, barking like dogs, so-called holy laughing, falling into trances, experiencing weird manifestations like gold dust coming out of the sky, expressions of various strange acts all in the name of Jesus, proclaiming that it is through the Holy Spirit that these works are being done. The simple question is this, would Jesus act like that? If through salvation we are supposed to change into His image, bearing the good fruit that we read in Galatians 5, our quest should be becoming more patient, good, loving, kind, having more self-control, walking in truth, desiring to be a good example by being different from the world, by being a light to it. So why are so many churches embracing occultism? In many cases, professing believers have followed false teachers that teach false doctrines, mixing pagan worship with worship to the living God. You know, a little truth mixed with a lie ends up being a lie. Well, our guest today to shed some light on this subject and share her testimony is Johanna Michelson, the author of The Beautiful Side of Evil, which is an extraordinary story about Johanna's involvement in the occult and how she learned to distinguish between the beautiful side of evil and the true way of the Lord. Johanna also penned lambs to the slaughter. And you may have seen her on Carol Matriciana's documentary, Wide is the Gate. Johanna is also a noted researcher and conference speaker and has spoken on many radio programs and TV shows. Welcome, Johanna Michelson. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have you on Love for the Truth. Uh, thank you, Cindy. What a joy to be on with you. I've really been looking forward to this. I have, too. We've, we've waited a long time for this show. You yeah, know, we keep getting it with one thing or another. I think last time it was a tornado, for pity's sake. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But we are ready tonight for an awesome show. So, uh, Joanna, we're going to jump right in. Why don't we just start by defining what an occult is for those who are unfamiliar with that term? Mm, you're starting with the occult, are you? Okay, well, there's a subject guaranteed to make us about as popular as an aardvark at an egg convention. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, well, you know, actually, the occult much is made of that. It comes from the Latin occultus, which means to conceal, the practice of secret, hidden, dark, mm. mysterious, esoteric things, things that are beyond the five senses, kind of the supernatural phenomena that's studied by parapsychologists who really essentially are shamans in mm. cute little white lab coats. Okay. And uh, it's also been defined as the mystical art of conforming reality to will by mastering mm. techniques of altered states of consciousness, the science of mystical evolution. And of course, all of that sounds like extraordinarily convoluted gobbledygook. It really is. Look, let me simplify it. Okay. <laughs> the occult really is summed up in Genesis chapter 3, uh, where it's Satan, you remember, in the garden was casting question and doubt mm -hmm. on who God is and the integrity of his word. Remember where he said to Eve, indeed, has God said? Mm. That translates into the occult as really there yes. are injunctions against practicing occultism, no, 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 no. Really? Did God really say that? Mm. Is God maybe a he, or maybe she's a she, or an mm. it, or the force out of Star Wars? Casting doubt on the validity of God's word, and then Satan said, you surely shall not die. You don't have a place of judgment where if you disobey the Lord and you ignore his commands, there are penalties and consequences. Mm. No, no, no. You surely will not die. You will evolve as you make reality conform to your will. You are going now into a science of mystical evolution, like 
Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Mm. Remember that book? Yes, I And did. all the other bird brains back in the 70s, mm-hmm. right? There was over 80s, there was this book written about the evolution of this seagull. Who cares? You get the point. Kind yes. of karmic recycling, the ultimate green program. There is no death, just cyclic reincarnation. And then here comes the kicker that is really foundational to mm-hmm. the whole realm and understanding of the occult. For God knows, Satan said to Eve, that if you eat of this fruit, if you disobey God, mm. you will be like God, and you will have knowledge and power. You will know good mm-hmm. and evil. And right there is the whole foundation of the occult. Word of God is unreliable. Don't bother looking at that. Mm. God is a force, and you can, through these special techniques, tap into the divine within until you ultimately realize your inherent personal divinity. And in a nutshell, that's what the occult is about. Yes, and you know, that, that was the same quote, has God said, is alive and well today. And you know, there's a lot of Christians eating of this type of fruit. And I, what I want to know, Johanna, is uh, we had spoken before, but uh, you had gotten into the occult. And what I wanted to ask you was, uh, were you a professing Christian when you fell prey to the practices? Mm, yeah, well, actually, the occult more got into me than I got into the occult. It okay. showed up mm. when I was about 11 and a half, almost 12. Mm. Uh, I was born in Mexico of uh, American parents and didn't know anything about the family history. And when I was about 11 and a half, almost 12, Something moved into the house and started scaring the living daylights out of the dogs, drove out any Mm. number of housekeepers, because something gave fright there. And uh, from that point on, I began to be very aware with the continual manifestations Mm. and, and sense of a presence that had moved into our home on that night, unlocking doors that had been locked, slamming other doors, causing all kinds of bizarre phenomena, I began to be very aware of the existence of another dimension, a spiritual realm. Mm. And it was a realm that was pretty terrifying and that clearly was, and I mean this rather literally, it would seem hell-bent on making the life of one little girl extraordinarily frightening and mysterious. And really, uh, I went through all of my high school college days, um, being very aware of these manifestations. Thankfully, others from time to time saw the manifestations that I was witness to as well, Mm -hmm. or I would have wondered if I'd lost what tenuous script some people assumed I had on reality. There were others who saw the things as well, especially when I was in college, Cindy. Hmm. But when I graduated from college and went back to Mexico, that's really when I actively got into the occult. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really through um, involvement with a group in Mexico City, the Silva Mind Control Method, it was called then. They figured out not too many years after that that people weren't too much into mind control. Mm -hmm. So they changed the name of it to the Silva Method. And it's one of any number of organizations across the world that uh, seek to train you kind of with a 48-hour self-help program to master the inner genius, Mm -hmm. your inner divine within, so that you can develop your genius potential and perform any number of truly extraordinary extraordinary mystical things, Mm -hmm. from stopping bleeding uh, to to doing the kinds of things that... um, that uh, the so-called sleeping prophet, Edgar Cayce, did. Right. He was kind of held up as one of the key examples. Edgar Cayce, mm-hmm. for those who may not be familiar, was uh, one of the most famed psychics of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And he found himself um, here, a, a, I think, solid Methodist Sunday school teacher who read the Bible through once a year for like 40-whatever years, uh, going into a deep, trends mm-hmm. through which somebody finally discovered that he could be asked it could be asked questions and give exact diagnoses and information mm-hmm. that was absolutely impossible to gain apart from supernatural means and uh, we were being trained to be very much like 
Edgar Casey. Basically, we were being trained to be shamans. They were compressing into 48 hours techniques of self-hypnosis wow. auto, uh, and auto-hypnosis uh, induction techniques, techniques of guided imagery, visualization, which are the foundation mm-hmm. of shamanism. Yes. They were training us how to at will enter and manipulate an altered state of consciousness, which any number of witches will tell you is the foundation of witchcraft, Laurie Cabot and others Mm -hmm. in The Power of the Witch, will tell you that learning how to manipulate altered states of consciousness is the foundation of all witchcraft and and, uh, power. And through them, uh, I met my counselors, One of the things that's very important for any shaman, Michael Harner, in his pivotal book, uh, I've got a copy of it in my hands, in fact, uh, The Way of the Shaman, Mm -hmm. says not only, um, he said, a shaman is a man or a woman who enters an altered state of consciousness at will to contact and utilize extraordinary or ordinarily hidden reality Mm -hmm. in order to acquire, ooh, are you ready for this, knowledge and power. Power, there where we heard that before, yes, to help in. other persons. And he points out that the main difference between an ordinary person and a shaman, Cindy, was, is that the shaman knows how to tap into and use his guardian spirit actively mm. when in an altered state of consciousness. And really, we were introduced to our special guides. They were called our special spirit friends, um, our wise persons, our counselors. Back then, they were a little more hesitant about calling these what they were, Mm -hmm. which is demons masquerading as angels of light. But as you asked at the beginning of of this, Mm -hmm. was I a believer? The answer is yes. Mm, I'd I'd grown up, Mm -hmm. at least in a nominally Christian household. We were staunch Episcopalians. My family sent me to a Catholic convent school, so I was certainly well acquainted with Jesus, although didn't know anything about a personal relationship with him. But my freshman year in college, someone had shared the four spiritual laws with me, Cindy, Mm. and I knew that I was a sinner, that apart from the saving power and a relationship with Jesus Christ, there was no salvation for me, Mm -hmm. and that it was by accepting him as my personal Lord and Savior Mm -hmm. that my sins would be forgiven and that I could have a relationship with God. I prayed and confessed what little Mm -hmm. I understood about confessing my sins, which I was so dumb I didn't realize I had as many as I did, and received the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior, my freshman year in college. And then all hell broke loose, because that's when the occult activity really began to intensify. A lot of people, especially in the church, assume Mm -hmm. that when you pray and genuinely receive the Lord, that all the works of the flesh, all the works of the devil automatically fall away. I wish I could tell you that was the case. And hence the title of my first book, The Beautiful Side of Evil. It was when then... Mm. I began to to get involved with civil mind control, and they said, look, you need two counselors. I said, oh, what better counselor can I have than Jesus? And okay, since I'm recognizing I am not, after all, the reincarnation of the great famed actress Sarah Bernhardt, all right, I'll ask for Sarah, too. We had to have two. And it was there that I began to have the most extraordinarily mystical beautiful, marvelous experiences in Mm. absolute contradiction and counterindication to everything I'd experienced from the time I was a little girl until that point in Cuernavaca when I was now, this would have been in 1971, Mm -hmm. learning how to be a shaman. This Jesus did some weird things, Cindy. Um, It was then that I began to realize that this control that I thought I had on the spirit realm was not what it appeared to be. We're going on a break. We'll be right back to hear Johanna's testimony. So please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back. So please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views through a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inherent Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. 
So please take everything you hear on this radio show to study and prayer. And thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome back. Joining us today, sharing her story is Johanna Michelson, the author of The Beautiful Side of Evil. She's also a researcher, conference speaker, radio and TV commentator. And Johanna, we're going to, uh, what I'd like to talk about is this silver mind control um, and the meaning of Jesus that you had going through these practices and through that, uh, the practices you met a woman in Mexico. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us about, about that story? Yeah, by the time I, I was involved in silver mind control, uh, I invited Jesus in as my personal Lord and Savior, and mm-hmm. now here he is in response to mm-hmm. Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and there he is. Mm-hmm. And for the first time in my life, I was sensing that I was being given a mastery over these forces that had controlled mm-hmm. me at will. And through Silver Mind Control, mm-hmm. I met a woman in Mexico City. Uh, actually, she had been uh, told, we had been told about her when we first started the Silver Mind Control course by the by the head of the the movement there in mm-hmm. Mexico, in Cuernavaca, in Mexico City. And he said that when he was uh, leading the course, he was taken to a woman who for some 45, 46, 48 years, I forget how long at that point, had found herself going spontaneously into an altered state of consciousness, very much like Edgar Casey, except that in that state, she was doing extraordinarily astonishing, medically impossible things. Mm. He gave testimony about how when he went to meet Pachita in the slums of Mexico City, she diagnosed him by rubbing a raw egg over him and dumping it into a container, Mm. which gave her a clear, exact, sometimes, by the way, in medical terms, diagnoses of Mm -hmm. what was wrong with him. And then she said, you need an operation. And next thing he knows, he said, he's sitting down, she's sitting in front of an altar, a tiered altar that was in the corner of this little room that was specifically used by Pachita for these diagnoses and these incredible psychic surgeries. Mm. She sits in front of an altar. The spirit comes, Mm. calls himself Hermanito, little brother, Cuauhtémoc. And while in the power of this spirit, who now is no longer referred to as Pachita, this is now a completely different entity, different personality, Mm. the spirit he claimed of the of a murdered Aztec prince who had returned to fulfill his karma, she then picks up a rusty hunting knife and a pair of scissors Mm. and plunges it with no antiseptic, no anesthesia, no cleanliness and and control of any, except unless you consider a bottle, a raw bottle of unopened alcohol, Mm. denatured alcohol, sufficient antiseptic for major surgery, plunges a knife into his knee and heals his knee. He oh said, my, my, my football injury was healed. Pain that I had had forever my was goodness. literally gone within days after this surgery. And no, it wasn't psychosomatic. Because I was a prize student um, and very well adept at the, the lessons being given in mind control, he said, Johanna, you need to meet her. And when I first met Bachita, oh, Cindy, hmm. The vibrations, the feel of this woman in this place, I describe it more in depth than we can go in here yeah. in, in The Beautiful Side of Evil, my first book. But I walk in and I see this, this old woman sitting there on a cot. It, we got there too late the first night to witness operation. She was puffing on a cigarette. Her arms covered in dried, crusted blood up, into, up oh to her goodness. elbows. Oh, and funny. I thought, dear God... What happens in this place? And I prayed that night, Cindy, and I said, Lord Mm. Jesus, living God, if I can serve you in this place, open the door. Lord, you know I want to honor you. If this is where I can use my gift and my ability, then let it be. She identified Mm. me that night as a medium, and for the next 14 months, Cindy, Mm. I went into Mexico City as often as I could, usually several times a week across the mountains, and helped uh, sometimes as as a witness. I witnessed well over 200 operations, but more often when I was there as a personal assistant, I was being trained to take Pachita's role 
as the vehicle, the medium mm. for this spirit wow. uh, when she died. And I saw astonishing things, inoperable brain tumors That's removed and healed, mm-hmm. a child born dumb given the power of speech, a man who had been wounded in the Korean War receiving a, a vertebra uh, a, a ligament transfer, uh, a man who had deteriorating vertebras and a tumor at the base of his spine from Los Angeles, mm-hmm. oddly enough, mm-hmm. having the vertebra removed, yes, I know I just lost any thinking member of your audience. I am telling you that according to Scripture, Revelation 13, Revelation 16, Revelation 19, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, mm. Genesis, there are spirits of devils working miracles, yes. which we, according to Jesus, are yes. going to see in increasing intensity and frequency. You know, it, it's interesting. People have said to me, Johanna, you could not possibly have been a Christian when all this happened. Mm -hmm. You were involved in yoga. I was teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. You were involved in meditation techniques straight out of Hinduism. I was practicing Raja Yoga and believed in reincarnation. Now I'm working with silver mind control, training as a shaman and a psychic, and working with one of the most studied psychics and true psychic Mm -hmm. surgeons of the 20th century. Um, followed only by John of God, who's highly touted by Oprah Winfrey and Wayne Dyer and Mm. others, and convinced, absolutely convinced, that it had to be from God, because surely God would not allow me to be deceived. And yet, Christian occultists, spiritual deception, according to Jesus, is Mm -hmm. the key sign of the end of the age. In Matthew 24, When Jesus was asked, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age and your coming? Jesus answered and said, look, see to it, no one mislead you. He says in verse 4, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. We're seeing false Christs all over the place. In verse 11, he says, for false prophets will arise and will mislead many. You guys are familiar with the New Apostolic Reformation? Yes with the resurgence of these self-appointed, self-proclaimed apostles and prophets who are now laying a new foundation that supersedes the one laid by the true and original prophets, who Mm -hmm. will come working great signs and wonders. Yes, and that's So as to mislead or possibly even the elect. And he's telling us, basically, in Matthew 24, verse 4, verse 11, verse 24, 25, that Christian occultists are the key sign of the end of the age. Sincere people, but who may well find themselves with all their sincerity, sitting in the middle of Matthew 7, but Lord, Lord, in your name we prophesy, cast out demons, did many miracles, and Jesus saying to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Mm -hmm. And one of the most frightening things to me and it has been increasingly so over these last 40 years, is the the demonic manifestations that we're seeing in the churches. You know, yes. I, I finally got out of the occult. It was a process. I prayed and renounced and confessed part of it in Labrie, went back to Mexico in 1972, more psychic than ever before. And here's the really scary part of my story. Mm. Because I did not understand about the fact that that even sincere people can be born with occult manifestations and occult abilities that masquerade as the genuine gifts of the Spirit. By the way, I do believe in the genuine gifts. Mm -hmm. You've got a slew, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, in in Pentecostal, charismatic, and now increasingly in Mm -hmm. mainstream churches across not just this country, across the world who are doing things like watching gold dust and hearing barking and snarling and and clucking like mm-hmm. chickens and yes. and all of the absolute grotesque manifestations the twitching and the things that by the way you will see carried out in any ashram in any occult center the yogis it's a it's a well-known set of phenomena that uh, that we're seeing in so many of these uh, churches today with sincere people who have taken their experience and made that the measure and the norm. Yes. And that's what happened to me. Here I was, a sincere Christian, but nobody told me about the importance of testing my experiences against the written Word yes, of God. Yes, I mentioned it. The genuine exists. The gifts of the Spirit are absolutely operative today. Absolutely. The Holy Spirit didn't croak at the end of the first century. Right. He hasn't been on a 1900-year sabbatical. But 
in the midst of the genuine, you have now seen, because of an unwillingness to obey the command of the Lord in First John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits Amen. to see whether they're from God. Why? Because many counterfeits are proliferating. It's the key sign of the end of the age. Mm-hmm. And so here I get out of the occult. Finally, I, I go to, to seminary for two, actually it was three years after I married in, uh, in California here. Find out if I committed intellectual suicide mm-hmm. by getting out of the occult and silver mind control, which I eventually did, and yoga, which I eventually renounced. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as Christian yoga. Mm-hmm. And I go to school, and I'm, I'm learning all of these things, how to test the spirits, how to, how to look to the Word of God. I get married, and then we decide to join a church. And we wound up at the vineyard in Santa Monica on the first Sunday that John Wimber, that this young pastor there, Ken Gullickson, was returning from these extraordinary experiences with John Wimber, one of the founders of one of the most deceptive movements mm. in the church today, the New Apostolic yes. Reformation, the vineyard churches. Mm-hmm. There are exceptions. There are good people in some of, in some aspects of this movement. But I will tell you the massive deception of seeing the same techniques, for example, of guided imagery and visualization yes. that I used in civil mind control and in yoga and, and in, with Pachita to become, thank God, the Lord short-circuited, but to seek to become a full transmedium, I experienced and encountered smack in the middle of the Anaheim Vineyard, and I've seen time and again in churches across the nation, and it is utterly terrifying. Sincere people who do not understand that Christians can and indeed will be deceived if they do not obey the command of the Lord to test the spirits in accordance with the Word of God. He hasn't left us to guess about this, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. It's an issue of wanting to know what the Holy Spirit has to say. There are four ways to get occult power. Through heredity, it can come down the family line. Mm. That's what happened in my own case. I had a great, great aunt who was a powerful and very world-famous telekinetic medium. She's all over the internet. Through experimentation, dabbling in some of these occult things, through laying on of hands. Mm. Anybody familiar with the charismatic Hagberg Pentecostal movement and the New Apostolic Reformation? Manifest Sons of God, yes. Latter Rain, Think Here, Transferable Anointing, and through devil subscription, selling your soul to the devil. There are all kinds of ways you yes. can get a cult power. Wow. The true mm-hmm. gifts of the Spirit, you are not born with it. You do not get it when you just attend a Todd Bentley or a Rick Joyner or a, a C. Peter Wagner conference mm-hmm. or a Patricia King or a Cindy Jacobs, etc. ad nauseum. There is only one way to gain true gift of the Spirit. John chapter 1, verse 12. It is to those who have received Him, Jesus Christ, to them He gives the right to be called children of God. Everything else is a counterfeit that needs to be identified, renounced, and rejected. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. If you just tuned in, our guest today is Joanna Michelson, ministry founder, conference speaker, radio contributor, and author of The Beautiful Side of Evil. And we've been talking about uh, Joanna's Joanna's, uh, testimony and some of the techniques that she got involved in while being a professing Christian. You know, uh, there are techniques today that the churches are using, and they are techniques with their origins related to shamanism. And... Johanna is going to share some of those techniques and how they're similar 
to what the church is using today. We've been discussing occultism and how it has entered the culture and now even the churches. And Johanna says that mixing pagan practices like Jewish shamanism and with worshiping the living God can lead to occultism. And we look back when the Lord wanted the Israelites to be set apart from the pagan practices of Egypt for this very same reason. Uh, Johanna, your testimony tells us that believers can in fact fall prey to doctrines of demons if they mix these pagan practices and worship while following and serving and worshiping the true living God. We see this in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Ezekiel 8, 2 Corinthians 3 through 5. What movements or systems of belief or belief systems can lead followers to occult practices? I think we want to just talk about that. Well, really, take your pick. Uh, any time that you depart from sound doctrine and from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, mm-hmm. which is one of the verses that you refer to in Second Corinthians chapter 11, 3 through 5, then you leave yourself open to engaging in practices that God has called abomination. You know, in Deuteronomy 18, God condemned absolutely every form of occultism, mm-hmm. from child sacrifice to superstition, divination, witchcraft, sorcery, necromancy. The tragedy is is that we're seeing that embraced by sincere people today. You know, sincerity in about Mm. six bucks these days will get you a nice cup of coffee in more stores. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is it you're getting involved with, and is sincerity enough to protect Mm -hmm. you from deception? The sad fact is the church right now is inundated with techniques such as contemplative prayer, walking the labyrinth, breath prayers that are promoted by some of the biggest names in Christendom. Mm. Uh, Rick Warren has a whole section on his his, um, website where, at least last time I looked a while back, he was promoting the practices of breath prayers. He Mm. speaks about it in in, uh, his book, Purpose Driven Church. Things that have their roots in ancient occultism. Ah! Yes. We'll say many pastors and devotees of this. But, Johanna, we're going back to the ancient practices of the early church. Mm-hmm. The Desert Fathers and the Desert Mothers yes. used these techniques of contemplative prayer. What is contemplative prayer? Uh, it's a practice in which you are moving now through techniques of repetition or focusing on prayer into a special place of silence where you're suddenly removing your consciousness from uh, the direct awareness, going beyond thought by the use of repeated words or phrases or breath. Mm. Oh, but Johanna, these practices are wonderful. They're helping us draw closer to God. Goody, which one? There you go. Mm -hmm. When you talk about Mm -hmm. going back to the practices of the early desert fathers and mothers, the early church, going back to the 3rd or 4th century in Alexandria, when a group of truly, genuinely sincere men and women sought to come away from the whole pagan influence in their society and draw near to God. Where did they get that idea? Probably from their Buddhist renunciate brethren with the monasteries and the convents for the Buddhist nuns and and monks. They picked up a lot of those techniques, Mm. and they began putting them into practice. Oh, but these are ancient, time-honored practices. Guess what? You didn't go back so early enough. Yes. Because while these indeed were adopted by the Roman Catholic Church from the 3rd, 4th, 5th century on, especially in the Middle Ages, the people going through Alexandria, which was the hub of, of civilization and, and uh, thought in those days, they needed to go back further. How about to the first century with mm. the apostles and the disciples? How about to the That's to the right. writings from mm-hmm. Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, the That's early right. church fathers, the true prophets? Because you will not see a single one of these mm. practices. I don't care that Sweet Beth Moore is promoting Brennan Manning and promoting the techniques mm-hmm. of Lectio Divina along with John Piper. And that, no, I'm not just pulling a name out. Right because I don't happen to like her. I think she's a lovely woman. Yes. She's taught wonderful things. But when Scripture tells me even the elect can That's be right. deceived, even if for a short while, yes. we need to pay attention. How did these things get reintroduced? They've always been a part of the Roman Catholic Church. The, mm-hmm. the monks, the Trappist monks, other renunciate monks in the Roman Catholic Church 
have always used these techniques, which were embraced by the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Incredible mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is with what? And what's a real clue for us today is there was an article in Newsweek magazine in September. Actually, it was September 5th, 2005. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, here it is. I've got it right in front of me. And it starts out this 17, 18, 20-page article, cover article, Spirituality in America. What do we believe? How do we pray? Where do we find God? He, they, the author of this article, Jerry Adler, starts out the whole thing with contemplative prayer. Mm. And he talks about Father Thomas Keating in the Quabog Valley in uh, Massachusetts, uh, where in the 1960s he had invited a great Zen master named Roshi Sasaki, actually he was alive even just a few years ago. He's got to be 180 now or oh, wow. close to it. Uh, I don't know if he's still alive, but he was a few years ago when, when Carol Matriciana and I looked into it. And um, for her wonderful film, by the way, yes. which discusses all of this, Why Does the Gate? Yes. I highly recommend it in that series. But they invited Rashi Sazaki, a Zen Buddhist, to lead retreats oh, at the Abbey. Oh. And they got so excited about it, Cindy, that they said, yes. well, you know what? Here we are in the 60s. We've got Maharishi Maheshogi, Transcendental Meditation, the whole drug revolution, which, mm-hmm. by the way, is tied to sorcery, pharmakia, the use of hallucinogenic drugs, to put you in exactly the same altered the same state altered of consciousness state, yes. of the shamans mm-hmm. and of those who are using these techniques in Buddhism and mm-hmm. Hinduism and the mystery religions to put you into the silence. And he said, isn't there a Roman Catholic way of doing the same thing that, that our beloved brother, Zen master, Roshi Sasaki, just led us into? And it, they messed around for a bunch of years, and around 1974, Father William Menninger, another Trappist brother at this monastery under Father Thomas Keating, came across a dusty old book called The Cloud of Unknowing. And it was a 14th century guide to contemplative Look meditation, which was identical. Identical yes. to that used by the Buddhists mm-hmm. and the Hindus in yes. many ways, especially the Buddhists. For pity's sake, all they did was Christianize it. That in Scripture is called syncretism. Mm-hmm. What is syncretism? Syncretism is a modern term used for the smooshing together of utterly disparate p- concepts and philosophies and practices. It is taking the practice of ancient paganism or beliefs or Mm -hmm. philosophies associated with it and thinking you're going to now sanctify them by sprinkling biblical terminology Mm -hmm. on it and using it to honor God. God hates it. How do you know, Johanna Michelson? Because I read the Word of God. Exodus 32, for example, you remember the first case of syncretism coming straight out of the chute. They've been released from the power of Pharaoh. They're wandering around in the desert. Moses is taking a little too long up in the mountain. Golly, God, why aren't you doing things on our time frame? And the Mm -hmm. people are all bent out of shape. Aaron, you need to give us a God we can worship. And Aaron, being ever the ultimate people's pastor, understanding and sympathetic to the felt Mm -hmm. needs of his congregation, and wanting to meet those felt needs, said, okay, hunky-dory, cough up all the gold jewelry, we're going to make ourselves something familiar. Mm -hmm. And he makes a calf, and then he says the most extraordinary thing, and here is the essence of syncretism. After he's made this calf, a molten calf, he says to the people, this is your God, O Israel, who Mm -hmm. brought you up from the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then he builds an altar before it, and then Aaron makes a proclamation and says, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Wow. This is the Lord your God. And God said, I don't think so. And in fact, in Mm. Deuteronomy chapter 12, you know, in Deuteronomy 18, he gives you an overview of every form of occultism that's abomination to the Lord your God. If I'd known that passage, I would never have gotten involved with yoga or silver mind control or pachita Uh or the rest of it. Mm. But in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 12, God says to them, by the way, beware when you enter into the land that you're going to dispossess, but where you're not ensnared to follow them mm. after they are destroyed before you, and that you, they, the people of the land, the Canaanites, yes. the Hivites, the Jebusites, all the other ites that yes, were running around back mm-hmm. then, God ordered them destroyed. Why? 
because God did not want his sacred people that he was setting aside for himself through whom his word would come and through whom Messiah would come to be contaminated with doctrines of demons. And he says this, You shall not inquire after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods that I may also Mm -hmm. do likewise? You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God. For every abominable act which the Lord hates, they've done for their gods. And then he said, look, and it doesn't matter that they've got genuine power. Deuteronomy 13, Cindy. Mm. And this ties exactly into your question about what, what about these movements? We can talk all day about the movements. Their yes. name is Legion. Wow. The Lectio Divina, the breath prayers, the mantras, never mind that Jesus says, do mm-hmm. not use vain repetition like the pagans. I'm planning a whole retreat for a group of ladies on how not to pray for Matthew chapter 6. Wow. It's going to cover a lot of this in mm-hmm. the contemplative. We can talk all day about it. Oh, but Johanna, they're so sincere. They love the Lord. Yes, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. sure they do. They are contradicting the Word of God. They're right. using techniques that the pagans use to worship their gods I don't care that it was used in the 3rd or 4th or Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. It was never seen anywhere in Scripture, except when God was bringing condemnation on it for it, like in Ezekiel chapter 8, where where even the high priest was involved in syncretism, standing there in front of the altar of the living God, but facing east, facing away from the altar with their backsides up in the air, worshiping the sun god, Mm -hmm. worshiping Tammuz, worshiping all these other... Oh, but there's genuine power there. Yeah, there is. And in Deuteronomy 13, the Lord God says through Moses, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, that's that's another thing you'll see with this whole new apostolic movement that we're talking about, the techniques coming in, Mm -hmm. the dreams and the school for the prophets where you can learn how to be a good operative little Christian psychic. He says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you, and gives you a sign or a wonder, and it comes true. Mm -hmm. Concerning which he spoke to you, let us go after other gods whom you've not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to see if you love him with all your heart and soul and mind. Ah, we'll say the people. But, 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 we're not following after other gods. We're following the Lord God. Really, which one? Because Scripture tells us there's a counterfeit Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 4, and 5, a counterfeit Holy Spirit and a counterfeit gospel. If it's going against the decreed written word of God, by its definitions, you can use all the right biblical terminology, but if it's not defined as God defines it, you've got the wrong one, and it's not from Him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, We read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. We've been having a wonderful conversation with Johanna Michelson, author of The Beautiful Side of Evil. We've been discussing occultism and how it has entered our culture and even our churches. We talked about mixing pagan practices with worshiping the living God and how that can lead to occultism. Uh, Johanna, you had mentioned in our prior conversation that we should discern, um, but how do we discern? How do we test the spirits? I mean, what does the Bible say? And give us some examples. So we know how to uh, discern the things that you're talking about here. Cindy, that is one of the most important questions that anyone could ask, and you're exactly right on the button when you ask that question. If more Christians did, we wouldn't be in the mess that Mm. we're in. Uh, Look, we're commanded in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Beloved, do not believe in every spirit, That's right. but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Mm-hmm. Why? Because many false teachers, many false prophets That's right. have gone out into the world. He said, test them. All the way through Scripture, you see command after command after command to test the spirits. 
And that is one of the key things. So what are the key tests? Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. The first is the test of doctrine. Mm. In Matthew 7, beginning in verse 15, this is Jesus who is saying, and mind you, this is the same Jesus who in Matthew 24, at the beginning of his list of, here are the signs of the end of the age, wars, rumors of wars, plagues, famines, earthquakes, on an unprecedented global scale. Mm. The first test he mentions three times, verse 4, Verse 11, yes. verse 23, 24, 25, is spiritual deceptions. False Christs, false prophets, who come with genuine power, like William Branham, the, the key apostle of the New Apostolic Reformation. Mm. How on earth do you know whether somebody like William Branham, who had genuine spiritual power, yes. how do you know whether he's from the Lord? That's right. Key question. Scripture says, Beware of the false prophets, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 15, who come to you in sheep's clothing, looking like true shepherds, but inwardly, spiritually, by what they're teaching you, are ravenous wolves. Mm. You'll know them by their fruits. And then he gives you a little lesson in spiritual agriculture, which every good, solid Christian occultist, and I was certainly one of them, Mm. would be familiar with. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes. Good tree produces good fruit, yes. bad tree bears bad fruit, good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. You know, it's a little lesson in basic spiritual yes. agriculture. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, uh, thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. And the problem is everybody stops at that point. Gee, mm. look at the New Apostolic Reformation. Look at Todd Bentley. Isn't that genuine revival? Look at the Toronto Blessing with John yes. Arnott. Wasn't that revival? Look at Brownsville. Look at, look at Saskatchewan. Aren't these manifestations of good fruit? Look at Kenneth Copeland. He flies a Learjet. Dave Hunt certainly didn't fly a Learjet. Isn't that good fruit? Read the rest of the story. Who was that, who was that wonderful old radio broadcaster mm. says, now for the rest of the story. Yes. <laughs> Here's the rest of the story. Verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7. These are the words of Jesus Christ. If you've got a problem with this, take it up with him, people. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who yes, is in heaven. You. Boy, you better know how to interpret Scripture by Scripture. In in John chapter 6, 28, Lord, what must we do that we may work the works of God? Mm. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus is not teaching us here a gospel of works. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, right. that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians uh, 2. But here he's saying, many will say to me on that day, verse 22, what day? The day of the great white throne judgment, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ after the tribulation. And at the end of that, the great white throne judgment comes before which only unbelievers appear. Said, And he says, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I declare to them, I never mm. yeah. knew you. Oh, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He's saying, what is an apostate? Apostate is someone who may have given verbal assent and knows the doctrine, but who has never truly received Jesus as Lord and Savior, or who has followed another Jesus. Oh, but, 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 they love Jesus, really? Which one? Yeah. Kenneth Copeland said, Believer's Voice of Victory, February 1987 edition of Believer's Voice of Victory, in his own words, he has a vision of Jesus, and Jesus says to him, Don't be disturbed, my son, when people accuse you of thinking you're God. They crucified me for claiming I was God, mm. but I didn't claim I was God. I just claimed I walked with him and that he was in me. Hallelujah. That's what you're doing. What? Yes. No. I never claimed I was God. Another Jesus, a different spirit, That's a right. different gospel. That's right. Kenneth Copeland says again, pray to yourself, because I'm in yourself and you're in myself. You don't have a God in you. You are one. Mm. When I read in the Bible where he, Jesus, says, I am, I say, yes, I am too. Cindy, I could That's give hard. you quote after quote yes. after quote after quote after quote of sincere people who name the name of Jesus and who are preaching another Jesus, right. a counterfeit Holy Spirit, who can, by the way, produce counterfeit occult manifestations. Mm. What is the occult? It's a, man of, it's a counterfeit of the genuine of God. Right. This little girl, Akiana, you remember these stories about uh, uh, heaven 
and the the, the near death experiences. Yes. That little boy Burpo um, and others who died and went to heaven. Children, sincere, love the Lord. And then he says, "Oh yeah, there's there's Jesus, there's Jesus," and he's pointing to a portrait of Jesus painted by Akiana Kramaric. Yes, this beautiful, talented young woman who says. Yes, this is what Jesus... Oh, but she's a Christian. Really? Here she says, and I'm giving you some quotes, I don't really belong to any religion, she said in, in a, mm. a magazine, Ventura County Star, in 2009. We all used to go to different kinds of churches. Now we have a home church, more like a conversation about religion. That describes an emergent church, yes, by the way, does. love mm-hmm. and unity. I accept all faiths. I'm picking out some... T- it's so neat to combine everyone's religion. And then she says, when she was 16 years old, Jesus shared with us, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Actually, it was the life. Light, yes. No man comes to the Father but through me. I feel that he invited... Now, listen to this, because this is the foundation of the contemplative movement and what's taught in New Apostolic Reformation, the Roman Roman Catholic version, and the so-called... Protestant version, it's a panentheistic perspective. God is in everything, including you. Listen to what Akiana said. I feel that he invited us to participate in the divinity. Each of us is one of kind, original path to the truth and light, and without our individual love and effort, we cannot understand and reach God. What Mm -hmm. she is saying, that Jesus and God is in all of us, it's a universalist perspective, God is in everything, there is no heaven, there is no hell, Brian McLaren said it, Rob Bell tells us love wins, Quote after quote after quote. Todd Bentley's Jesus. Is he the one you're following? Jesus manifests himself to Todd in his little uh, room before he goes on stage for his performance to pray down the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bam as he Mm. was kicking little old ladies with cancer in the stomach. And he said Jesus appeared to him with gold dust and feathers and and Mm. jewels. And Jesus said, oh, my son, you need to get them to believe in angels and the supernatural. And even Todd Bentley said, huh? I thought I was supposed to get them to believe in you. And Jesus said, oh, my son, Mm. they already believe in me. But if you can get them to believe in angels, angels, and the supernatural, then you'll really see the stuff. Another Jesus, yes, it was. a different spirit, yes. a different gospel. These people may love Jesus, which one? The Jesus in my psychic laboratory was not the Jesus of the Bible. Which Jesus was that? God the Son, second person of the Trinity, mm. born of a perfect, pure virgin. Yes. By the way, not conceived without sin, as the Roman Catholic dogma tries to make you believe that Anne also conceived by the Holy Spirit, as Mary did. That is Roman Catholic tradition of man that has nothing to do with Scripture. The Jesus who was born the perfect sinless child, laying aside his divinity, yet still perfect God and perfect man, who lived the perfect sinless life in the power of the Holy Spirit, as we are instructed to do when we become true believers, who performed many miracles in the power of the Spirit, who then was crucified in the flesh, who died in the flesh, who was buried in the flesh, and on the third day arose by the power of God and ascended into heaven after he was seen for 40 days by over 500 witnesses, not duped fools who were saying, I believe, I believe, I know it's stupid, but I believe. People like Thomas who said, unless I put my fingers in his wounds, I will not believe. Mm -hmm. And then he falls at the foot of the risen Savior and says, my Lord and my God, Mm -hmm. that Jesus who ascended into heaven Mm -hmm. and today sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, is that the Jesus you believe in? Mm -hmm. Or have you embraced a counterfeit Jesus a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit gospel. Have you embraced techniques like meaningless repetitions and mantras and rosemary, rosary beads? Rosemary beads, they might as well be. <laughs> Centering prayer, Lectio Divina, contemplative prayer, breath prayers, the labyrinths, the soaking prayer out of IHOP. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're saturated with yes. everything we're talking about. The guided imagery visualization techniques that are straight out of shamanism. The worship of angels, 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 conjuring Jesus, channeling Jesus like Course mm-hmm. in Miracles. The automatic writing. We haven't even touched no. about yes. poor Sarah Young 
and, and Thomas a. Kempis, who think they were channeling Jesus. Boy, did Jesus get really stupid in his old age. Some of the most blasphemous perversions yes. that are put in the mouth of our Savior by Thomas a. Kempis, promoting purgatory, promoting asceticism, promoting the, the, the whole Roman Catholic version of the Eucharist. Jesus calling that is promoting absolute New Age mystical mm. balderdash. Are these... Is this the Jesus you're following? The, the, the Jesus of the witches? Do you know there are... Christ, you should Google Christian witches. I had over six, between 6 and 10 million hits on Google on Christian Wicca. Yes. Is that the Jesus you're mm. following? Mm. Christian yoga, which I guess is right up in there with Christian tennis and Christian swimming. Which Jesus are you following? Yes. Because if you are not testing those experiences... By the word of the living God. In Isaiah 8, and I know we're running out of time, Isaiah 8, the Holy Spirit says, And when they say to you, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Mm. Consult the dead on behalf of Benny Hinn. I wonder if he even blushed. When, when June 6th, the Supreme Court of the United States made, uh, made homosexual relationships, the lesbian, gay, L, LMNOP, yes. super letters there that goes mm-hmm. with that. When that was made the law of the land, he said back in, in 1989 or thereabouts, the Lord's holy God told me that by 1994, 95 at the latest, the Holy Spirit was going to destroy the homosexual community. Really? This Benny Hinn who's lying on the graves of Amy Simple McPherson and Catherine Kuhlman? I will tell you, every form of occult perversion has been embraced. Oh, Johanna, but you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Have you taken a good look at this baby, people? This is Rosemary's baby you're talking about with these things we've been listing here. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. I want to personally thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Please visit our website at www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. That's www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. Dot com. Well, we've had a wonderful, wonderful conversation with Johanna Mar- Michelson. Johanna, um, there was just so much here, and it's probably hard for a lot of people who do follow some of the people that you mentioned. And I just want to say this, is that we are not against those uh, that we've mentioned other than what they're preaching. Any one of us can fall prey to the occult, just like Johanna did. Uh, There are many professing Christians that are falling prey to paganistic, shamanistic uh, practices. So, Johanna, I know there's people saying, oh, my gosh, you know, so much was said here. I think I'm involved in a movement. Um, I I realize that, uh, you know, maybe what I'm involved with is a different spirit, a different Jesus. I'm not sure. But what, what should they do? The first thing you need to do is understand that there is no freedom apart from the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Jesus we just spent a few moments describing, the Jesus spoken of in in the Gospels, that Jesus, the Jesus spoken of by the prophets. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved, Acts 4. Mm. Then you need to confess it. The second thing you need to do is confess it. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When the occultists in Ephesus, in Acts 19, recognized they had been following a demonic god, a counterfeit, they confessed, they repented, they renounced it, they turned their back on it, mm-hmm. and got themselves out of it. That's the second, third thing you need to do, is renounce it. Second Corinthians chapter 4, 2, we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, and you need to, that means you never go back to it again. Amen. And you need to clean house. Deuteronomy 7, do not bring an abomination into your house. Uh, I've prayed, I don't know, with dozens and dozens and dozens of people over the decades. That's one of the key things. The books, the John Crowder books, the 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 Todd Bentley books, the materials from people who, however sincerely, have been promoting doctrines of demons 
The Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. You need to get that out of your house. And then you need to learn what it means to stand firmly in the Word of God, to contend for the faith, to return to what God is calling us to, the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ that relies on the true God, on His Spirit, on His Word, and doesn't need to use occult techniques to manufacture demonic experiences, which I promise you will invariably wind up changing your theology to that of the doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. Be on the alert. We need discernment in these days now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. I would like you to give your information. How can people get in contact with you, and how can they get a hold of your book? Uh, My books, sadly, are out of print, although keep me in prayer. I'm working really hard on releasing a new edition on that. But uh, the books are still available through independent uh, retailers, I guess, on Amazon, Mm -hmm. The Beautiful Side of Evil. And the second book is called Like Lambs to the Slaughter, Your Child and the Occult, which is published in 89. Uh, Keep me in prayer. I am going to be doing that. We now have a new little ministry, and if you would like to learn more about it, you can email me at johanna, that's J-O-H-A-N-N-A, at michelsonministries.org. Johanna at michelson, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-E-N, michelsonministries.org and I will be happy to let you know what we're doing and uh, put you on a brand new little mailing list for a little newsletter that I'm doing and a very informal simple one but we're working on it okay well thank you Johanna it's been amazing you are a wealth of information um, especially on this topic and I think many of us need to know more about it to discern thank you so much for your many years of uh, sacrifice and uh and you serving the Lord in this manner. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. God bless.